Welcome to the Book Studio. I'm your host, Beth Ann Patrick, and today we're trying something a little different. We're in the FM studio, and across the table from me is Michael Pollan, author of In Defense of Food and Eater's Manifesto. Michael, thanks for being here today. Sure, Beth Ann. Good to be here. It's great to be here. It's a little bit different, but hopefully it'll be a good kind of different. And this is the second book that people know about. The first one, of course, was The Omnivore's Dilemma. Mm -hmm. So why... Did you need to write in defense of food after the omnivore's dilemma? Well, I, you know, I didn't plan to write a second book on food, mm -hmm. but um, the reaction to omnivore's dilemma convinced me that there was still some dilemma out there, and uh, and that many readers, uh, you know, omnivore's dilemma was really a story about where your food comes from, and mm -hmm. it really looked at the environmental and ecological or political right. implications of our food choices. But a lot of people would come up to me after that book came out and say, you know, I love your book, but I can't finish it. And that's not – that's always troubling to a writer to hear that. Why did they say they couldn't finish it? Well, they said – they explained that, um, you know, every time they turn the page with something else, they can't eat anymore. Uh -huh. And they're afraid if they get to the end, they'll starve. And um, <laughs> that was too bad. Um, so – but it also as – I, as I would draw them out, it was clear that they that – they, that it was almost too much knowledge, too much information, and they really wanted somebody to kind of say, okay, now knowing all this, what should I eat? How should I eat? How should I eat for my health? And that really is, as much as people are interested in the environmental implications of food, mm -hmm. finally, they're interested in their personal health uh, implications of, of those food choices. So I set out to write a book that would just kind of explore the whole issue of what do we know about the links between mm -hmm. diet and health? And... What I found was, uh, you know, in some ways we know a lot less than we think we know, that nutrition is still uh, a very primitive science in many ways. That was really interesting in the book. There are so many things that are unanswered. We don't know exactly why some foods have more nutrients than others. We don't know how those nutrients work or how they combine. It is primitive. Yeah. And, and one of the things that came up, I, I was thinking, you talk a great deal about eat food, in other words, things that aren't processed. But there are some benefits to processing. You do talk about things like fermenting and pickling and, and that kind of thing. But for many years, especially in the mid-20th century, people longed for processed food because spoilage was... Was a huge problem. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And, but there, there's processing and there's processing. I think that mm -hmm. post-World War II, we've kind of achieved a whole new threshold of what processing means. I mean, when you talk about fermentation or canning or mm -hmm. freezing, these are things that um, are, you know, we have long experience of biologically, culturally. Um, but when you start uh, making, you know, foods that are, you know, highly synthetic, um, that are, you know, preserved not through those kind of natural processes but through chemical processes, um, you're talking about something different. And also that, that kind of, let's call it that first order processing, um, really preserves a lot of the nutritional value of what you start off with. Indeed, when you ferment foods, they get more valuable uh, very often. Um, you get, uh, you know, vitamin B12 when you ferment something, um, which might not have been in the food initially. You don't get that when you make a Twinkie. You don't get that. No. <laughs> what happens when you process that, that to, to that extent is you lose nutrients. And so you have this uh, food industry that makes money the more it processes, the more uh, processing steps the more profitable the food becomes and the less nutritious. So, for example, if you start out with, uh, you know, a whole grain like oatmeal, and, you know, that's my one of my favorite breakfasts mm -hmm. is just oatmeal, um, it's very nutritious. It's really cheap. I mean, I can buy a pound of rolled organic oats for 79, 89 cents, and a pound of oats is a lot of oats. You get They're a lot of breakfasts. You get a lot of breakfasts. But it's hard to make money if you're General Mills selling that. Um, so what they do is let's turn it into Cheerios. And that level of processing, suddenly you're getting four or five bucks for a few ounces of oats. And you've, you've lost some of the nutrients. So you then have to add them back in in the form of fortification. Wouldn't some people say, well, I like the texture of Cheerios yeah, better? Yeah. And and that's fine. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-Cheerios. I think it's a, it's a relatively wholesome food. It's, it's, it's as processing go, it's fairly simple. And you, you know, have milk on it. It's more convenient than making oats. But then go to the next step. You see, now, oh, uh, now Cheerios are a commodity. You've got, you know, every store doing its own right. store brand. 
So what do they do next? Well, they go to the Honey Nut Cheerio cereal bar with the layer of synthetic milk going through that it. That is one of the oddest foods it's, I've ever it's seen. It's really odd. And, <laughs> and, you know, once you get to that point, you're really in the realm of the candy more than the cereal. Well, it's true. So many of these bars really are candy bars. I mean, bars. I think we kid ourselves to think these things are health foods. And they're sold yeah. as health foods. And... Um, but the point is that, you know, they get more and more expensive the more you process. And there's even one step beyond that now. I've started to see these cereal straws. Yes. And it's this extruded oatmeal material that your your kid is supposed to sip milk through. <laughs> and these are really expensive by the ounce or by the pound. And so so there's a real conflict between the, the basic business model of food manufacturing right. and, and our biology, uh, which is better off with the least processed, simplest the foods. The simplest foods, because one of the things you talk about in changing lifestyle to accommodate your slogan of eat food, not too much, mostly, mostly plants, plants, is cook. Cook for yourself, because when mm. you do cook, you're less likely to get into ingredients that are overly processed or that don't exist in nature and are made yeah, in Yeah, I'm betting you don't have any high fructose corn syrup in your pantry. You know, not now. I mean, I really, no, I've really. But I mean, as an ingredient. As an ingredient, exactly. Nobody cooks with it. I mean, all these chemicals that you see on the the labels, nobody has them in their pantry. Well, what I was going to say is you're talking about the, the fact that the processed foods are more expensive. But a lot of people would argue, Michael, I go to my farmer's market and the prices are exorbitant. I can't afford the organic produce. What do I do? And that's where. By frozen produce. Frozen produce. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is very nutritious. Yes. You don't lose anything in freezing produce. You might lose the, some texture in certain mm-hmm. foods. The texture is not as good. But the fact is frozen uh, vegetables are very cheap. You can get like two boxes for $4 or right. something like that. And they're very nutritious and they're very convenient. They don't take a lot of war- work. You don't have to wash anything. And um, so, you know, people pe- – I don't know. I'm, I, I actually lose a little bit of patience with people saying right. I can't afford to cook from real food. Um, yeah, the farmer's market is expensive, and that's a function of demand, by right. and large. Um, there is so much demand for really high-quality food right now, and that's an exciting thing. And And I cannot begrudge a farmer for getting a good price for food. I mean, these you know, you're paying a, a good price for those uh, those vegetables, but those farmers aren't getting rich, and, well, and they're getting all the money. So I always feel that that extra money is a vote, not just for a high-quality item of food, but to keep local farmers in my community, to keep landscape in farmland right. and not houses, uh, to cut down on energy consumption. There's so much I'm getting for that extra money that I don't get at the supermarket. And, you know, CSAs, I think, are actually a very cost-effective yes. way. And you do mention them in the book. Today, you know, I went to a local restaurant that I know has a farm-to-table program because I thought, well, I'm interviewing Michael Pollan. I've got to make sure that I try all of this. And what really amazed me was I decided to get a three-vegetable plate. Mm-hmm. And I chose an asparagus from Virginia and cremony mushrooms that were from Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. But then all the other vegetables came from California. And I thought, the shipping, Michael, the shipping, what do we do about that when you can't, at your farmer's market, you can find, you know, since we're in Virginia, all products from the mid-Atlantic region. But what happens when you go out for a meal and they say, oh, this is organic, this is special, but it's come all the way from the other coast? Well, when I'm given a choice between an organic product that's traveled across the country and a local product that isn't organic, mm-hmm. I tend to get the local product. It's going to be fresher and tastier. And most local farms are not giant monocultures mm-hmm. with a with a you know serious need for pesticides. Right. If they're diversified, small local farms, they may not be certified organic, but for all intents and purposes, they are. Um, you know, if if you're growing five or ten crops for a farmer's market or some, or you know, you have a truck garden of a farm of some kind, you're not using lots of chemicals. Um, and in fact, you know, it's it's an important question uh, when you are at the farmer's market um, to ask farmers about, well, how do you, you know, what do you, how do you handle pests on your farm? How do you handle fertility? The, mm-hmm. the right question is not, are you organic? Because that's what most people ask and that's what most people are looking for. And the farmer is duty bound to say no if they're not certified. But there are some very sustainable farms So what's that question? The question asked them is, how do you deal with pests? How do you deal with fertilizer? Do you use synthetic fertilizers? Do you use synthetic pesticides? Mm -hmm. Those are the important questions about method. The word organic can only be used by people who actually are certified. And some people don't want to be certified. They have 
you know, political reasons. They don't want the government in their business. Well, or... that brings me right back to um, Joel Salatin, Joel Salatin yeah. from the Omnivore's Dilemma. And so last week at another local restaurant, I made sure to have the Polyface Farms chicken. Oh, and aren't pork you belly. lucky? Yeah, I was lucky. And that's what that was the, the thing I wanted to bring up was as Joel, of course, has his certain political reasons for using local sources rather than organic sources right. in some cases. But this chicken was a revelation. And I don't want to go on and on about it and bore everyone, but it truly was a different taste. It, it tasted like chicken is supposed to taste. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I saved it. I ate it for three days. I thought I'm never going to be able to go back to Purdue. Thank God. Yeah, and it is. It is a different food. That's what I want to talk the about same. is the taste. Yeah. I mean, well, the what you need to understand is, like, why do they taste so good? It's basically he grows them on grass and rotates them. They're on fresh grass every day. So they're not just eating corn and soy meal. They're eating right. grass and bugs. And that uh, completely changes the flavor and the texture of the chicken. They're, you know, genetically they're the same breed right. that Purdue is using, Cornish cross chickens. But the way he uh, raises them and the way he feeds them um, makes for a uh, – and I would, I would venture the way he slaughters them too. It's a low stress, lower mm-hmm. stress kind of situation. Um, makes for a really superior chicken. And um, anytime I have the opportunity to eat a pastured chicken, you know, which you're mm-hmm. seeing more and more in the market, right. and pastured eggs, uh, that is a product worth, um, worth spending more for. And it's it's not comparable. You know, you look at pastured eggs might be four or five dollars or six dollars or seven dollars in the market, and you know we're all outraged at that. We really feel like cheap food is a birthright. It should be eighty nine cents. Now that's a, a really good point because I think that Americans, post war Americans, do believe that our milk, our eggs, our bread are supposed to be very very cheap. And people in other parts of the world who spend so much more of their income, uh, the the Spanish, I think you have it's seventeen point one percent. Yeah, and of we their spend income. nine point. Five percent. That's a big disparity. Well, our food has been sold to us on the basis of quantity rather than quality for a long time. And cheap food, you know, pile it high and sell it cheap is a slogan of a, a, of a uh, supermarket chain around here. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's an odd thing because we understand the connection between price and quality everywhere else. We understand when we're right. buying clothing. We understand when we buy a car. In fact, Joel tells this wonderful story of a, of a guy coming into his shop and complaining that his pastured eggs were 3 or $4 a dozen. And Joel very politely points out the window and says, is that your car? And the guy says, yeah. He says, well, sir, I see you. You understand quality. You've got a BMW out there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's the same thing with eggs. You, you get what you pay for. It, and it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And you know, what? another thing that really fascinated me in, in defense of food is that it's not just the quality and the taste and sometimes the texture or whatever, but it's also the nutrients in the yeah. older varieties. You talk about apples and some of these strains, I um, like to buy apples in Charlottesville from a particular purveyor who has all kinds of heirloom, heirloom varieties. And you say, and you've done research on this, they have different and often better nutrients, even when they're grown now alongside you know, a yeah. gala apple In tree. side-by-side comparisons, many of the heirloom varieties have uh, much higher nutrient levels of various nutrients. And, and the example I think I cite is that uh, when it comes to zinc, a modern mm-hmm. commercially grown apple, you have to have three of them to get the same zinc levels as you would get in, a, in an older one. It's not totally understood. It may be a function of breeding. Mm-hmm. It may be a function of soil. Um, we, we're, we're learning that soils that are, that are very well um, nourished uh, without chemical fertilizers, so really complex living soils, produce food that has more complexity and more nutrients mm-hmm. in it. And um, so there is, a, there is a kind of virtue in those older varieties and in growing them organically, uh, whether you know, technically organically or not, but without synthetic fertilizers. And we also know that over the last 50 years, the nutritional quality of much of our produce has declined right. by between 25 and 40 percent. And um, this is the USDA's own numbers. They've tracked this over the years. And it's not entirely understood why, but it may be about the soils, that over time our our chemically treated soils are losing a lot of Mm -hmm. biological activity. It may be that we're breeding for yield rather than nutritional quality because you can't select for everything. And if you're emphasizing 
redness in an apple or size in an apple or speed of growth in an apple. You can't emphasize zinc. Exactly. And you're not going to. And so we've lost something along the way. Now, some people in the produce business, you know, think this is a plus. I I remember reading an article in in the, The Packer, which is a magazine for people who sell produce, um, and they said, we can turn this to our advantage because now you need two carrots to get the value of one. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a magazine for everyone. Isn't there? There really is. But that brings me to something, you know, you talk a lot about HFCS, high fructose corn syrup, and and about corn, of course, in the omnivore's dilemma, we, we all know corn is not quite the benign thing we thought it was. But if corn and soy are these incredibly adaptable plants that give this incredible yield. Isn't there a way that food scientists could harness this for good and not for evil? <laughs> well, to some extent they have. I mean, you know, tofu and its, mm-hmm. and its various permutations and, and the fermented versions of it, like tempeh and things like that. These are, you know, these are really good foods that, you know, over, I mean, it wasn't modern food science. We've been doing it for thousands of years, I guess, in the case of tofu. That there are good foods that can be made from these things, um, and from pasole, corn as well. pasole from corn, and polenta, and polenta, yeah, you know, corn meal. I mean, so there are ways to process corn and soy that make very nutritious food. I mean, you look if you want to get carbohydrates or protein or fats off off the land, these are good crops for it. We've been breeding for yield. We have not been breeding for nutritional value. And if you if you want good tortillas, you're not going to you know make them out of number two commodity corn. Right. You're going to use you know some of the older white corn varieties. And um, but you know, I guess you can imagine a food science that is making better food than ours is. But it depends. You know, there is there is this phenomenon, which is that. Food science doesn't yet know how to synthesize foods well um, because it, too, is fairly primitive. And our bodies know what to do with something like corn because we have been with corn for thousands of years, and our bodies know how to take nutrients from it and make very good use of it. Our bodies have only been exposed to high-fructose corn syrup for a very short amount of time, and our bodies are fooled by it and overwhelmed by it very often. So um, there is something kind of very fit about the relationship of our bodies and the foods we've evolved with that we don't yet have with highly processed foods. Well, that's a very interesting point because one of the things that also was surprising in the book is that food scientists, not the nutritionism Mm -hmm. kind of people, but food scientists have found that it really doesn't matter what foods a culture eats. The Maasai subsist on meat, milk, and blood. Yeah. And they're fine. And and they don't have the kinds of problems that we found in the Western diet. So... And other cultures on all plants. On all plants or... And some on all fat. I mean, Mm -hmm. the Inuit, you know, eat seal blubber, basically. You know, (laughs) it's a a 90% fat diet. They have some interesting recipes. So. <laughs> I'm less tempted by their diet than some others. But th- but the, the point is that, you know, humans don't have one ideal diet. We have shown ourselves to be well adapted to a great many different foods. Whatever nature has to offer on six of the seven continents, we have been able to make a healthy diet from. It's quite It's quite extraordinary. The one diet that we seem to be very ill-adapted to is this industrial Western diet that most of us are eating. So, what an achievement for a civilization to come up with the one way to feed itself that kills itself pretty that reliably. That leaves us overfed and undernourished. Yes, and, and suffering from the, this whole range of chronic diseases. You know, these diseases, heart disease, mo- uh, 40% of cancers, type 2 diabetes, obesity, these do not exist in these uh, cultures eating traditional diets. And I know we, there is so much more that we could go into, and I, I know I have to wrap it up, but... Do you have your own garden now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I've been gardening uh, on and off since I was a boy. Mm-hmm. But um, since I moved to California, uh, I have a very small garden. I have three raised beds in the front yard. And, um, yeah, gardening is, a, is a, you know, one of my favorite kind of pastimes to uh, get away from the word processor. <laughs> it uh, definitely does not cause the carpal tunnel. You know? No, it's a whole different set of skills. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a wonderful, meditative, low stress and, and not perfectionistic thing. I mean, in other words, there's such a great margin of error in gardening. You really can't screw up too badly. <laughs> 
And um, so I find it a very relaxing way to so, spend time. And it's it's stunning how much food you can get out of a small plant, uh, a small plot of land. I mean, people who complain about the, the price of fresh local produce, well, try growing a little bit yourself. You'll find it's very cheap. So eat food. Not too much. Mostly, mostly plants. plants. Excellent. It's In Defense of Food, an Eater's Manifesto by... Michael Pollan, and it is from Penguin right now, out in paperback. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome, Beth. It was good to be here. Join us next time on The Book Studio.